Hey everyone, thanks for checking out my Xbox retrospective. I'm going to go through my collection today as well as the full Xbox library to find any notable and worthwhile games. Hopefully this lets you know about some Xbox games that maybe you didn't know about that are worth checking out. I wasn't planning on doing Xbox this early, but given the recent E3 announcement that the original Xbox was coming to Xbox One's backwards compatibility, I thought it best to do it now. The announcement comes at a great time for Xbox fans, because the original Xbox is a console that hasn't been emulated properly, and classic hardware is dying because of leaky capacitors and other faulty equipment. So if you haven't, I highly recommend you break out your old Xbox and remove the capacitor that's really causing a lot of systems to die. Look that up first. <laughs> There were quite a few backwards compatible games available on the 360. There was actually about 460 original Xbox games that you could play on the Xbox 360. So hopefully all those and more come to the Xbox One. The Xbox had a ton of great PC ports and also worked hard to secure a bunch of exclusives so the system has a ton of stuff worth playing that you might not know about. Also, in this I'm going to go through mostly exclusives. I plan on doing multi-platform games uh, in a later segment after I've done all the platforms. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that on the Xbox, most games that are multi-platform work best on it. It is just a more powerful machine and a lot of stuff looks really good on it. I'm going to try my best to avoid uh, talking about some of the multi-platform games, but because I'm going through my collection and they're in my collection, I, I might hit on a couple really quickly. Originally, the system launched with this huge Duke controller. Um, it's massive and didn't really help the system's image, which uh, gamers already thought was way too big of a machine to have that massive controller along with it. A smaller S-type controller was released, uh, I think first in the Japanese market, and eventually became the main controller over here. There was an HD kit released for the Xbox that allowed you to hook up component video, and eventually a bunch of third parties came up with Xbox component cables, and I highly recommend them. They make the games a whole lot better. Most games on the Xbox are capable of putting out 480p. Not all of them, there are still some 480i games, uh, but for the most part, yeah, most of them put out progressive. And surprisingly, there are a couple games, very few, but a couple that put out 720p and 1080p, which is pretty incredible for the time. The original Xbox was Microsoft's entry into the console market, which was a pretty surprising thing at the time. Even though Microsoft was well known for its operating system and other PC software, American companies hadn't really had success with consoles. The Xbox launched on November 15, 2001 and was the most powerful console released at the time. It was also the first console to include the hard drive and Ethernet port. It sold pretty well and managed to beat up the Dreamcast and GameCube, but it couldn't compete with PS2's crazy numbers. While I'm not one to promote piracy, the Xbox is notable for being the first console that was heavily modded for piracy during its lifespan. I mean, I know other systems like the PS1 and 2 were pirated pretty massively, but this was a scale I don't think I'd ever seen before. Uh, and mainly it was due to the success of the Xbox Media Center, which was a homebrew application that really set the standard for media centers moving forward. The XBMC was officially rebranded and released as Kodi, and a lot of people still use that today. Alright, so on to the games. Uh, as you can see, I've got quite a few Xbox games, way more than I thought I had before I started to do this episode. And actually, after the announcement that the Xbox games were coming to Xbox One as backwards compatible games, I went out and I bought uh, pretty much any cheap ones I could find that I wanted. Uh, most of them are actually upgrades from my PS2 games because the Xbox games just look and play a lot better. Uh, for most of those. So things like Prince of Persia and Silent Hill, I picked up the Xbox versions and uh, that is probably why you'll see some of these black cases in here. It's mainly because they were just so cheap that uh, I had to pick them up. Some of them I paid as cheap as a dollar for. Uh, so I'm looking forward to playing all these games again and even if they don't come uh, to the Xbox One backwards compatibility, just hooking up this system again and seeing how good these games look over component really made me realize how much better the Xbox is for these games than the PS2. The Xbox had an impressive launch lineup of 20 games, and a good 5 or so are really notable. The rest of them are still pretty good. A lot of them are ports from PS2 games, uh, so I'm not going to mention those, but they are still like good versions of those games and worth checking out. Uh, you know, as launches go, it's actually a pretty solid lineup, and I think it'd be pretty happy at launch, especially considering the kinds of games that systems launch with now. So first off is... Dead or Alive 3, uh, starting the kind of Team Ninja exclusivity for Xbox. Uh, DOA 3 is the first DOA that wasn't an arcade game first. It has 17 fighters and 4 new fighters. And, you know, I don't think the DOA series gets as much respect as some of the other 3D fighters like Tekken or Virtua Fighter. But I really like this series. I really like the kind of rock, paper, scissor mechanics of the combat. And uh, I think it's just fun to play. So I really dig this series. Next up is the obvious heavy hitter. Halo Combat Evolved. I mean, at the time, no one knew this was going to be the huge success it was. 
you know, it's debatable whether it or Goldeneye did more for first-person shooters on consoles, but definitely history has shown that Halo is one of the most important first-person shooters on consoles. Um, it's real fun. I mean, the multiplayer in this was, was fun, but also the single player just had a great campaign. Um, a real fun sci-fi story, a lot of cool weapons and environments. Uh, I just really dig this game. Even though I've bought in the, you know, Master Chief Collection and I had Anniversary, uh, I still keep this one because I have real fond memories of playing Halo 1 on the Xbox. Oddworld, much as Odyssey. Oddworld is a series I love and hate. I love it because the games are great. I hate it because um, the creators had a plan and they're not sticking to it and it really is frustrating to know that there are supposed to be five main games in the series each having a new protagonist and supposedly telling this amazing story where they all come together at the end and to know that we're only got two of them so far so they keep putting out other games instead and while those other games are great i wish they would just stick to their guns and put out the main games they always had planned so uh, much as odyssey the follow-up to the first two games that were for ps1 uh, starring Abe. This game also stars Abe, except he goes into a factory to save Munch, who is a uh, a different species of animal in Oddworld, who is actually their species is going extinct, and he's looking for more of his kind when he gets captured. So he is saved by Abe. They team up, and they, you know, fight back, and it's a really cool story. The gameplay is now completely 3D, and it's fun. It feels well. It's just a good game all around. One other game I want to mention, even though I don't have it in my pile, is Project Gotham Racing. I think the Xbox had two real major exclusive racing series, and Project Gotham is definitely one worth noting. Uh, so that first game, again, I didn't play it. I'm not a huge racing fan, but it's definitely notable just for being the first game in that series. Just the week after the Xbox launched, we get Amped, which I love. I mean, you know, these old sports games usually aren't good to go back to, but snowboarding games i think are all over the place and my favorite snowboarding game of all time was cool borders 2. i love the mechanics i love the risk and reward of priming a trick to to do it and amped really took that formula and just made it better you can kind of tweak your tricks after you prime them and so it gives you a little more control and it just looked great it felt great it played like cool borders which i loved you know the cool borders three and four just changed the formula and didn't work for me at all uh 1080 i never really got into so this is probably my favorite snowboarding game that's ever come out after that silent hill 2 so obviously a port of the playstation 2 game but silent hill 2 may be one of the best psychological horror games of all time it may be the best survival horror game and the xbox version was i believe the first place that you could play the extra scenario so the game stars a character Maria and the Xbox version had a little kind of side story that you could play through as Maria that added a bit more to the story. That eventually came out for the PS2 in the Greatest Hits version, but they didn't really advertise it. So I didn't even know about that till very recently that you could get that on PS2. You just have to get the Greatest Hits version, which isn't called Restless Dreams. Uh, so it's pretty confusing. But anyway, uh, again, an amazing game and a great version of it. Speaking of great versions of PS2 games, Genma Omniusha, which, so I said I wasn't going to talk about too many multi-platform games, but this one was kind of a step above. It was a big deal for this game to be re-released on Xbox. Omniusha was a great PS2 game, and only the first one was released on Xbox, but they did a lot to update it, and, um, you know, they enhanced it in a bunch of ways. They had new areas and new attack modes, and, I mean, it's a great game, and this is just the best version of it, so it's definitely worth noting. That's followed up with a game I just picked up today, Circus Maximus Chariot Wars, which I remember being heavily promoted at the time that the Xbox was out. If you went into an EB, this was always running on the demo station. It looked great. Um, apparently, it's just kind of okay, but still really interesting. I know it has a lot of fans. The uh, game is supposedly a really good look at Roman history and chariot racing. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Next up, one of my favorites, Jet Set Radio Future. A follow-up to Jet Set Radio or Jet Grind Radio on the Dreamcast. An amazing kind of really stylish roller skating graffiti game. Um, actually, Future I don't think is quite as good as the original. The wide open stages are actually really confusing. I remember specifically being stuck in one area for quite a while because I couldn't get out of it. Uh, the graffiti controls have been simplified to make it a much smoother play experience, but I still kind of miss the, the risk reward of doing a big graffiti when you know you're being pursued and uh overall it's still a great game i just think the first one's a little better but definitely worth checking out because there's no more in the series so after that our first game that's not backwards compatible on the 360 
Gun Valkyrie, which was created by Smilebit, who was the developers of games like Jet Set Radio. Uh, the game was originally in development for the Dreamcast, and it was designed with a really unique control scheme where you use the controller and the light gun at the same time. It's a third-person mech game, and uh, because they couldn't get that control scheme over to the Xbox, they just went with a dual-stick control scheme that it doesn't work quite like you'd expect, so it takes some getting used to, but overall, it's a really cool game. The game has two playable characters, and it's 10 stages long. Really quickly, I want to talk about this personal pick, Hunter the Reckoning. This is not an exclusive game, uh, but its sequel is. I just want to mention quickly, it is a really cool four-person co-op action game. It's kind of a top-down action game where you have magic, guns, and melee attacks. It's just a blast for, mul for multiplayer. Next up is a game I don't have here for reasons I'll get into later, but Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. Uh, I think everyone probably knows this game, at least if you're into RPGs. Morrowind was the third game in the Elder Scrolls series following Daggerfall, and it was a breakaway hit. I think it really brought that kind of Western RPG mentality to consoles, really gave the series a solid footing that a lot of gamers look forward to, uh, the later releases of Oblivion and Skyrim. And it's just, some people consider it the best in the series. For me, it's a little too hardcore. Um, I prefer the simplicity that came with later installments, but I know a lot of people love Morrowind, and it's well-deserved. Next up, continuing Sega's run of exclusive titles. Crazy Taxi 3. Originally began development as a game called Crazy Taxi Next, and it was supposed to be an online multiplayer game. Uh, but they kind of scrapped that and just made it a... A different yeah and just made a sequel to crazy taxi one and two so this one takes place in a vegas like city and it's got all that you would expect from a city like that uh, it plays just like the regular crazy taxi game so you're just driving around picking up fares dropping them off for big money and trying to keep the clock going as long as you can it also includes the cities from crazy taxi one and two so you can go back and play those and in the city from crazy taxi two you're driving around at night time so they used a kind of leftover day night mechanic that they were saving for crazy taxi next and just use that night part to make that city a bit different uh overall a really fun game i love the crazy taxi series it's fun to just get in and play for a little bit and uh, move on to something else so i highly recommend it next up is a real treat for fans of the show which is buffy the vampire slayer the game now you would expect games like this to be pretty bad i mean the alias game and the dark angel game were all pretty bad but the buffy game actually turned out to be pretty good they got back a lot of the original cast i think buffy is the only person who's not in there sarah michelle geller but her sound alike is pretty good and everyone else is great it's uh the story was written by the people who write the buffy novels or some of the buffy novels and they did a great job the story takes place during th season three of the show and it involves the return of the master who was the season one villain so it's a third person action game. It takes place in 13 different stages throughout Sunnydale and you have to kill vampires in ways that would actually kill them. So you can use your regular combat to knock them down and then you have to uh, stake them or burn them or do other things that would kill them. So uh, overall a really cool game worth checking out for fans. The next game I want to talk about is another one I don't have now, but I believe it was actually one of the first games I picked up with my Xbox, which is Dead to Rights. Um, it was a timed exclusive for Xbox, so at the time you could only get it on Xbox. It was a kind of a Max Payne clone, so it had that same bullet time, dual gun shooting mechanics. Uh, but the neat thing about this one was you had a canine partner, uh, Shadow, who was, you know, you could use him to take down enemies and stuff, and it was just a fun little cop game. Right after that, we got Sega GT 2002, which is a follow-up to the Sega GT game. A decent racing game, I mean, it doesn't really, it's not really worth going back to now. One thing that's worth noting is later on it was bundled in with consoles along with Jet Set Radio Future, so there are a lot of versions of that game out with those two bundled together, uh, so you might check it out if you have it there. Next up is, okay, so like I mentioned earlier, a lot of PC games came to this machine, probably because the OS was based on Windows and um, they could do it pretty easily. And one of my favorite PC series is Myst. So Myst 3 came out for the Xbox and it's a really cool game. I mean, it continues the story from Myst 2. Uh, it continues the story from the novels, which I, I love the Myst lore. It's really good. In this one, you return as the kind of unnamed main player who's visiting actress who's uh, kind of decided to write a new world. So in Myst you write worlds into books and they kind of link you to those worlds And he wrote this world for his people to go live in since their world was destroyed and it gets taken So you chase after the culprit you have to figure out who this guy is why he stole the book and get the book back And it's uh, I mean again Myst is a it's got really interesting puzzles And it's a really cool exploration game, but the story is amazing if you haven't dived into it 
Unreal Championship, which was a Xbox exclusive version of Unreal Tournament 2003. They basically rebuilt the game from the ground up for Xbox and uh, those Unreal Tournament games are crazy fun. If you can get a, you know four people together and play some split screen, at the time that would have been a blast. Also, I believe Unreal Championship could be played on Xbox Live, which hadn't launched at the time, but you know in a couple weeks it was coming and that would have been a great thing. Right after that we have Blinks the Time Sweeper, which I think a lot of people remember. Uh, Microsoft kind of tried to position it to be their mascot, uh, you know, to compete with Mario and Sonic and Crash or whatever. Um, and it, it was a cool idea for a game, it just didn't quite work out. In the game you play this cat, Blinks, who uh, can use his magical vacuum cleaner to uh, manipulate time. So he can rewind time, fast forward, slow it down, pause, he can record himself so he can do multiple actions at once. It was a pretty cool game. I think the concepts were done a lot better later on in La Ratchet and Clank and Crack in Time, but for the time it was interesting. It just didn't do that well and so it never really took off as a series. Following that is Toe Jam and Earl 3, which fans of the original series don't really love, but I think it's a cool thing that it came out. Apparently it was in development for a lot of consoles, originally for the N64 and later for the Dreamcast, and they managed to take those Dreamcast assets and finish the game for the Xbox. So. The game is completely in 3D for the first time, and it tries to take concepts from Toe Jam and Earl 1 and 2 and mash them together. So it takes like the random worlds of Toe Jam and Earl 1, and it takes some of the platforming aspects from Toe Jam and Earl 2, and tries to mix them together. Uh, and I think it does an okay job, and there are a lot of fans don't love it, but it's a pretty cool game. The game introduces a new third character, Letitia, who is a female character who travels to Earth alongside Toe Jam and Earl to kind of find these sacred albums of funk, so they're exploring the world for that. Later on you could actually download new levels for the game through Xbox Live, so that's one of the first cases we see where Xbox Live is starting to come into play. Next up is House of the Dead 3, so this was the first console release of House of the Dead 3, the third game in Sega's light gun shooting series. Uh, if you haven't played House of the Dead 3, the thing that makes it kind of crazy and different is that your default weapon is a shotgun. So uh, I highly recommend you check out the arcade version if you can find it anywhere. Uh, the game is, I think, the latest in the timeline, so it takes place after House of the Dead 4. And it's got a cool, you know, typical cheesy storyline that those games are known for, but it is a fun light gun shooter. It also includes a time attack mode to add a bit more to it, and Mad Cats did release a gun attachment that you could use. Although that's harder to find now, and really it's not worth it for just that one game, especially when that game has been ported to other systems, uh, but worth noting. Alright, next up, love it or hate it, Shenmue 2, which actually comes with a DVD. Shenmue the movie, it has all the cutscenes from Shenmue 1, although they're pretty badly rendered. Um, just to catch up people who didn't play Shenmue 1 on the Dreamcast, Shenmue 2 was developed and released on the Dreamcast in other regions, I think in Japan and Europe, uh, but we got it over here exclusively on Xbox, and the original Shenmue game was designed to be, I think, 13 chapters long. They never explicitly said that that would be 13 games, but the first game, which was fairly long, only covered one chapter, so I think in Shenmue 2, um, they ignore chapter 2, which was just him on a boat, <laughs> And then they do chapters 3, 4, and 5 in this game. Um, and a lot of people didn't dig the game because even though it tried to be this open world game, um, it had a really dense kind of small open world. There wasn't a whole lot to it. So you had to kind of, it was more of a relaxing game. Even though you had this pressing story of trying to find your father's killer, you were spending a lot of time just like playing arcade games in the arcade and... Uh, buying capsules from capsule machines and practicing your fighting moves in different ways you know it's designed by the virtual fighter creator so it used the engine from virtual fighter for its combat i love the series i think it's a nice slower paced kind of open world experience i can't wait for shamu 3 to come out and i think it's really worth checking out if you have a bit of patience next up is metal gear solid 2 substance and I believe this came out first on Xbox. I might be wrong. I actually didn't even know there was a PS2 version of this game until the kind of triple pack came out for PS2. And uh, this was a version of Metal Gear Solid 2 that had just a ton of extras in it. So a ton of extra VR missions, um, you know, extra story missions, and just a ton of cool stuff in there. So for fans of Metal Gear Solid 2, it was worth checking out, especially because it just looked a lot better at the time. Now you don't really need it because it's bundled into like every HD collection that's come out for Metal Gear, but for the time it was the best way to play the game. 
Next up is another game I don't have here, which is the original Mech Assault, which was specifically designed to showcase Xbox Live. So the Mech Assault game takes place in the Battletech universe, uh, so that's a shared universe with games like Mech Warrior. Uh, you control a mech, obviously, and you uh, kind of fight against other mechs. Um, they had a single player mode with a bunch of missions, but the main showpiece was multiplayer. So once Xbox Live launched, you could get in there and play with a whole bunch of other people online, and it was a blast. Which brings us to Xbox Live itself. The service launched on November 15th, 2002, and it allowed players to play with other people across the world. Uh, it was a unified service, unlike other games that individually did different online stuff. Um, so it had all the matchmaking and friends lists and all that kind of online service stuff you've come to know from later Xbox games and current uh, console systems. Um, it was really a good showpiece for how that stuff works and it set a good foundation for how that stuff would work in the future. Uh, you could also download games from the service later on, although there weren't very many, and you could download some DLC. It was really successful for the time, if you consider the install base. Uh, within the first couple months, almost a quarter of a million people signed up. Uh, there was a kit that was released that came with a headset too, so, so a lot of people had that headset and that really helped build the community. Getting into the Star Wars stuff, Star Wars, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, <laughs> that's a mouthful, uh, basically the follow-up to the hugely popular Jedi Knight game on the PC. Uh, this game takes place two years after that expansion for the original game. Um, Jedi Knight itself is a follow-up to Dark Forces, so it still kind of retains that first-person shooter roots, but uh, now that you are a Jedi, you can use your lightsaber. The camera switches to a third-person perspective if you're using your lightsaber to make that a bit more fluid than it was in Jedi Knight. Um, you still play Kyle Katran, who was the, who is the main character for this whole series, and uh, he kicks ass like always. So he's got his gunplay, he's got his lightsaber, he can do all kinds of force moves, and uh, he's just a really cool character. The game has a multiplayer mode as well, so on consoles you can go head to head with another player. It's not quite as uh, expansive as the PC multiplayer, but you take what you can get. Um, and it did also come out on GameCube, but this is the version I played a ton of, so I'm mentioning this one. All right, next up a game we have to talk about. I don't have it. I'll never have it. It is way too big for me to keep anywhere. Steel Battalion is a mech game that Capcom released that came with a giant mech controller. If you haven't seen this thing, it is ridiculous. It is, it's got pedals, it's got over 40 controls. It's basically designed to give you the most realistic mech tank experience there is. Um, the game launched with a single player campaign that uh, you basically, yeah, just go through with your mech and blow stuff up. Uh, that is if you figured out how to start your mech. Um, you know, you had to read the manual and figure out what all those controls did. Um, one really unique thing about the game was if you didn't eject when your mech blew up, your character died and your save data was deleted. So you'd have to start the game all over, which I kind of appreciate. I mean, I hate that in some of those games that do that, but in this one you have a chance to eject, so if you don't, it's kind of your fault. Next up, another Sega classic. Um... Panzer Dragoon Orda, so the fourth game in the Panzer Dragoon saga, made by Smilebit, who took on a whole bunch of the members of the team that previously created the Panzer Dragoon games. Um, this one is just a beautiful looking game. It's back to that traditional Panzer Dragoon rail shooter style, so no more RPG elements. Uh, but it is just, like I said, it's a great looking game. It's a real fun game. It's a great game for the series to go out on. Uh, sadly, we didn't get any more games after this, but. Again, a really cool game. So the game stars this girl named Orta who's been a prisoner for so long and a dragon breaks her free and she and the dragon kind of try to outrun the Empire who are uh, pursuing her. The game has a ton of extras in it. There's a whole bunch of lore in the menus you can find that really expand on the world of Panzer Dragoon. You could play the original Panzer Dragoon 1, a port of it that looks amazing, on the Xbox which is really cool. So just a ton of cool stuff in it. I highly recommend it. Going from Sega, probably the biggest exclusive supporter to the system, to one of the other big exclusives, uh, supporters Tecmo and Team Ninja's Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. Um, Extreme Beach Volleyball is a game where Zack from Dead or Alive creates this resort island and invites the girls from Dead or Alive to the island to come and play volleyball and compete in different mini-games. Um, you know, I thought this was a lot more of a solid volleyball game. 
Uh, but it, it really sets the tone for the rest of the series. All the kind of mini games that come in Dead or Alive Extreme 2 are in here. So there's your pool hopping mini game. There is, you know, giving gifts to the girls. And there's a casino where you can go to win or lose money. You know, a lot of the game is about kind of fostering your relationship with the other girls so you can partner up and be better at volleyball. It's a cool game. I think it's... Uh, yeah, this one is one or two players, which is great to have a mode that you can play with multiple players. I know the most recent game didn't have that, which is frustrating. But again, if, if you love Dead or Alive, it's just a whole bunch of fan service. Right after that, I'm going to mention Fantasy Star. Episode 1 and 2 came out. I don't have that game because it requires Xbox Live. Those servers are down, so the game is essentially useless now. Uh, plus, it came out on other systems, so I'll keep my Dreamcast and uh, GameCube versions to play that offline. And that brings us to Microsoft's next big attempt for a huge hit game. Brute Force, which at the time had a ton of hype. This was supposed to be better than Halo, and day one sales were better than Halo. Um, but over time, I think pretty soon after that, people started to note it's not quite that great, and I haven't heard anyone talk about it in forever. I never played it back then, so I picked it up today for two bucks. I'm looking forward to trying it out just to see if it is any good, if it does hold up at all. Uh, so I'm going to do that, and I'll let you know. But it is basically just your typical third-person action game. Um, you know, shooter anyway. There's 18 missions here, it says, and you can download content from Xbox Live. So at least they, uh, you know, did that. Apparently four players, so you could do some multi-screen mode probably, and up to eight player land support. So I guess they put a lot of work into it. All right, back to Star Wars with one of the most notable games on the console, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Now, I know you can play that on PC. A lot of these games you can play on PC, but I love consoles and I want to play these games on consoles. So, um, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is Bioware's first, like, just a massive RPG that's, um, well, that's, that's unfair. They've done a ton of huge, great stuff before this, but this is the one that kind of set the tone for them moving forward. It was this kind of gameplay that led to stuff like Mass Effect, and uh, it feels a lot like Mass Effect with a Star Wars license. Um, it's a great game in its own right. It's got an amazing story. It takes place in a great time period of the Star Wars universe, um, and it, it's just a great kind of Western RPG. Next up is Siberia, which is kind of a personal pick for me. Because a lot of PC ports came to Xbox, that means a lot of good adventure games came to Xbox, and the adventure genre was basically dead at this point. All we were getting is just a, a trickle of adventure games, and this was one of those. So uh, Siberia is a game where this lawyer, Kate Walker, goes to this remote uh, France village, and uh, she's there to finish the sale of this toy factory and ends up getting caught up in this you know, worldwide adventure that... Uh, all surrounding the mythical island of Siberia. So uh, there's this game, there was a sequel, Siberia 3 just came out for console, so I'm looking forward to replaying these to play that and see how that story goes. Again, it's your typical kind of point-and-click adventure. It's, if you like that kind of stuff, it's definitely worth checking out. Next was kind of a cult hit at the time. I don't hear people talk about it so much anymore, but I think it's definitely still worth mentioning, and that's Otagi, what is it? Myth of Demons. Um, this is an action game by From Software, and it's uh, really cool. It takes place in this kind of feudal Japan time where the main character, Raiko, manages to break this seal between the demon world and the human world by accident, and a whole bunch of demons flood the world. Uh, so he's practically killed, but then he's saved by this princess who gives him a new body and basically charges him with killing the demons. It is a really cool 3D action game. Um, there are some RPG elements. There's 25 levels in it, and it's really notable for having these destructible environments where a lot of things in the environment can be destroyed, uh, and you have big sweeping attacks that make that really easy, so it's a fun game. Next up, I'll mention Soul Calibur 2. Obviously, that came out for everything, but the special thing with Soul Calibur 2 was every console had a different special character. So for Xbox, the special character was Spawn, which is kind of neat. Uh, there aren't any Spawn games on Xbox, I think, so I'm surprised that deal went through instead of Master Chief or something, but... Uh, you know, at the time, that was probably a really cool thing. Right after that, I want to talk about Dino Crisis 3, which is a game I think I need for my collection. I had it at one point. It's not a good game, but just for its pedigree, you know, being part of the Dino Crisis series, um, I, I kind of want it back. So it's a Dino Crisis game that takes place in space, way in the future. Um, all of the dinosaurs you're fighting are these DNA-mutated dinosaurs and reptilians, monsters. It's just a, a silly a silly take on that kind of uh, third-person shooter formula. 
It was originally in development for the PS2 as well, but uh, that version was cancelled. So I'm not sure if it was cancelled because the Xbox version got bad reviews or if that was always going to happen. Which brings us to... The only game that is current that has been announced to be compatible with the Xbox One, uh, Crimson Skies Road. Yeah, Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge. This is a um, kind of 1930s air combat game. Um, it's got a really neat mission, mission structure, so it's all open, and you just kind of take on missions and fly to the objectives and complete them and get in different dogfights and stuff. It's a it's a really cool game. It's actually the follow-up to a PC game called Crimson Skies that I don't think anyone really knows. And both of them are based on the FASA uh, board game, so I didn't know that either. But overall, it's a really cool game, and I think the reason it's so beloved is actually because of the Xbox Live Online multiplayer, which they said is the servers are going to be going back up, I think, for the new backwards compatibility, so that's definitely something worth checking out. The campaign mode had 20 different levels and 10 different planes, and the online mode had four different multiplayer modes. That brings us to Grab by the Ghoulies, um, which is a, the first game that Rare released for the Xbox. So Microsoft purchased Rare, uh, so they were no longer making exclusive Nintendo games, now they were making exclusive Xbox games, and this was the first one that they released. I think it was in development for a Nintendo system before uh, they were purchased and switched over. It's an interesting game. It's not as quite as beloved as Rare's previous games, but it's still pretty cool. It's this game where this uh, main character and his girlfriend kind of get stranded and end up in this creepy mansion where she gets kidnapped by the mansion's owner and he goes in to save her. It is a 3D kind of action adventure game. As you explore the mansion, you get attacked by monsters and you use your right stick to kind of attack in that direction. So it kind of feels like a twin stick game, even though it's a 3D adventure game. There's parts where you go through these rooms where they're scare set up and you get scared and you have to do quick QTEs to kind of not get too scared. So it's it's there's uh, some interesting concepts there. I don't think it quite hit the mark, but it's still pretty interesting. And now the reason I couldn't talk about Elder Scrolls earlier is because this is the version I have. Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind Game of the Year Edition. So it's got the complete base game in there. I mean, at the time, you couldn't download this big of a stuff over Xbox Live, so they had to put it in on disc, and I'm glad they did, because that's the way I like it. This has the two big expansions for Morrowind. Tribunal, which is a expansion where your character can go to this new city that's ruled by these living gods, and he gets wrapped up in the politics there. He gets uh, sent on missions by the Dark Brotherhood. And it's got Blood Moon, which is a new island that appears in the game. Um, that is under siege by vampire uh, sorry which is under siege by werewolves and your player can actually become a werewolf uh, so again just some great expansion content for an already great rpg next up amped 2 i actually haven't played amp 2 despite my love of amped 1 i picked it up today for 250 so i figured it was time to give it a shot apparently it's got all new mountains and 10 different like professional snowboarders you can do snow skating now which makes it a little more like skateboarding controls so I'm looking forward to check that out. Um, if it's anything like the first game, I'll probably love it. There's also a uh, new Xbox Live connectivity, so there's five different modes you can play up to eight players, so that would have been really cool for the time. Next up is the reason I mentioned Hunter the Reckoning earlier, which is Hunter the Reckoning Redeemer. It's actually the third game in the franchise following the PS2 exclusive uh, Wayward game. And this one is the Xbox exclusive sequel, so it takes place a couple years after Wayward everything i don't think it's quite as well received as the original game but it still it has that four player co-op um, that i love so definitely something worth checking out two more games i don't have here that are worth mentioning first is kill switch or kill dot switch um this is a game that namco made that was kind of mediocre for the time but it's notable for being the first game that really introduced cover mechanics so it like time crisis it was that kind of game where you could it's a third person shooter, you're running through the level, oh there's a wall, you press a button, you crouch behind it, and then you can pop up and shoot uh, bad guys. So it didn't work quite as well as later games like Gears of War made it, but it's notable for being the game that really introduced that mechanic. Right after that is Project Gotham Racing 2, so the sequel to the first Project Gotham Racing, and that game is highly notable, not just for its good racing, but also because it introduced the world to... Um, Geometry Wars, which was a little hidden mini game inside it, and that obviously blew up into its own thing after PGR3, uh, but highly notable for that reason. All right, next up, 
the Xbox version of Counter-Strike. So Counter-Strike, the hugely popular uh, Half-Life mod, became its own game. Probably, maybe the most important online FPS of all time. Still going to this day, huge fan base. It really pioneered that idea of once you get killed, once you're dead. And so these matches of, you know, five versus five, where last man standing is the winner, is just a really cool idea and Again, this is not really worth playing at this point. It's really notable that this came to Xbox for that time. Right after that, Star Wars, Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy, <laughs> the follow-up to Jedi Outcast. Uh, this one, Kyle Katran is not the main character. Instead, he and Luke are teachers at this Jedi Temple School, and you kind of create your own character and play an apprentice. So you are joining this school, and those two send you on different missions. So. Uh, it's got all the combat you'd expect from the previous games. It's got a, even more emphasis on lightsaber combat than the previous game. Uh, it's got a pretty interesting story. You know, it's worth checking out if you like those other games. Next up is a really weird application. I don't have it. Uh, I don't know if it's even useful at this point, but it's definitely worth noting, which is the Xbox Music Mixer. Uh, so it's not a music generator like some of those MTV games. It is actually kind of an enhancement to the media capabilities of the Xbox. It lets you, using an application you install on your PC, it lets you move pictures and music over to your Xbox. So you can show those pictures on your TV. You can kind of manipulate the audio of the music a bit. You can create playlists and do things like that. Um, I think it has vocal stripping, so you can strip the uh, vocals out of songs and then you can use those in karaoke because it supports karaoke with a microphone that came included with it. Uh, it's got tons of features like that. It's a really weird thing. But now that I think about it, I wonder if it was created explicitly for the Japanese market because they, you know, they love karaoke and also I heard that like putting your pictures on your TV was a really big thing around then at the time. Next up is Deus Ex Invisible War sequel to the huge PC hit Deus Ex. Um, this uh, sequel only released on consoles for Xbox. I don't think it's considered quite as good as the original game, but it is still, you know, it's this really cool stealth FPS. The original game was known for the choice it gave you, uh, and I think this one does even more. So it, within the plot, there's a ton of choices you can make, and even through gameplay, you have a lot more options. Uh, the story is set 20 years after that first game. Uh, it's worth checking out if you love that series. And the last game I'm going to get to for this part of the retrospective, this caps off 2003, uh, and I'll go through later years in my next video, but this is Broken Sword the Sleeping Dragon, so another PC adventure game, but one I love. I love the Broken Sword series, and this is the game that really got me into it, actually. Um, it's a 3D game now, so the point-and-click stuff is gone. Uh, it's got a real simplified move around, inspect items, use objects kind of interface. It's actually the kind of direction I wish adventure games went instead of this kind of telltale thing we've got going. But regardless, it sees the return of George and Nico. Uh, they're doing different things, investigating different cases, and they get there wound goes. up again in this crazy conspiracy surrounding a cult. So uh, if you like adventure games, I would say this is probably the one on the machine most worth playing. Uh, but that's my personal opinion. Thanks for checking out that episode. Uh, I have a part two coming up soon that's going to finish off the library, but before that's out, I just want to cover a couple games that I missed in this one. So, uh, first up is Azeric Rise of Parathia. This is a game that came out in November 2001, and it's an action game starring the protagonist who journeys through the world gathering elemental disc fragments. Azura can use the different elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and mix and match powers to make new abilities. So it's a pretty interesting exclusive action game. Next up is Serious Sam, which came out in November of 2002, and this is a combination of the first two Serious Sam games from PC, First and Second Encounter. Serious Sam is kind of like Duke Nukem, it's a crazy first person shooter in which Sam takes on an extraterrestrial race that's invading earth and travels through time. There was also Fusion Frenzy, which is a kind of multiplayer focused game. There's a whole bunch of mini games for uh, you to play with your friends, over 45 in fact. I think the sequel was a little more popular, which came out for Xbox 360, but it's worth noting because it is kind of a short-lived mini game series that Microsoft tried to put out to compete with things like Mario Party. Oh, so thanks for checking out this episode. I'll get back to you with part two soon. Thanks.